Barlany Prison, Glasgow. But it could almost be any prison anywhere. Existence is one long, tedious, unchanging routine. Every act is in response to a shout of command, and life is as drab and grey as the uniforms. But only a few yards away is a different prison within a prison. Beyond the heavy green door marked special unit are some very special prisoners. The five men kept inside this high security unit are all convicted killers. Since they were brought from various other prisons to this unit, violence in the Scottish prison system has fallen dramatically. In this yard, the casual way in which the inmates and the staff mix is the essence of a unique experiment in the world's penal systems. These are men normal prisons found to be dangerous or disruptive. There seemed no way of coping with them, a problem worsened by the fact that they could be detained for years, if not the rest of their lives. Each prisoner has a set work program which he can do as and when he pleases. They wear their own clothes and visitors are allowed almost any time. There's no segregation of staff and inmates and they call each other by their first names. Well, my personal opinion is that the CIA... One concession to normal prison procedure, however, is that they're locked in separate cells overnight, cells which can be made much more homely than in a normal prison. They call them rooms. Security is strict with a higher ratio of staff to inmates than in other prisons and everyone has a responsibility for the running of the experiment. Although the special unit is within the walls of Berlini prison, it is self-contained and completely cut off. Governor Gordon Jackson is in charge of not only one of the most remarkable prisons, but possibly the smallest in the world. The governor, the staff and the prisoners make decisions at regular weekly meetings. All have their say on things like outside visits and which new prisoners might join the unit. The overriding aim is simply to sustain a workable community. I'd like to move into his metal in a sculpture. I was wondering how, if I could have access to, you know, scrap metal and um, materials for working with scrap metal. You know, this is a step forward from the straightforward sculpture that he's been doing before and he wants to go into this sort of media, I don't see that we have any right to say no. Uh, I think he's proved himself already in the type of sculpture he's doing and the benefits he's getting from it, not just for what he's producing, but what uh, it does for him. And I would be only too happy to see him go try another media. Get me to meet people. This is Rab, convicted of stabbing a youth to death. At the time of the offence, he was 16. For this, he spent the last 14 years, almost half of his life, inside prison. I've been in just over 10 years. I'm in for manslaughter. And I've uh, been in about half a dozen prisons in England and Scotland. You've also uh, been accused and found guilty of several attacks on officers in various prisons. 1965, attempted murder of a prison officer. 1968, attempted murder of three prison officers and uh, common assaults and another two. 1972, uh, serious assaults and four prison officers. Mm. And there have been little incidents in between, you know, common assaults and things. So altogether you're doing a life sentence plus 26 years for the various assaults? Yes. How does this prospect hit you? Well, it's deflated me somewhat, you know. But I just live from day to day. I don't I get up every day, you know, and sit down and say, oh, gloomily that I'm doing life in 26 years, you know, and I wouldn't be out for another 20 years. Does the thought ever strike you that you might never, ever be out at all? Oh, yes. That's, that's quite... That's quite a strong probability, you know. It's on the cards. I was sent to prison in 1968 for murder at Edinburgh High Court. I killed my ex fiance um, It happened down in Ayrshire, West Bride. I was in a suicide pack with her. 
bad in the keep it. What was your reaction in when you were sentenced to, to, to life imprisonment? Did you? When I was sentenced to life, I was relieved to get sentenced. But then I was sent to Peterhead Prison. I started to rear up and smash up because I couldn't do my time. And then they sent me to Perth Prison where I'd done the very same. I was always getting put in Rule 36. Ended up by slashing a person in the jail. OK. Of course I was tried for, for um, three murders. But what, what the hell is this? People have to go with, with um, the law. If they go with the law, then I was found guilty of one murder. By Christ, I'm paying for it. But I'll tell you this, I'm also paying for two other murders that I was completely um, freed on. I was found guilty of murder. What had you done? What you were supposed to have done? I was supposed to have uh, stabbed a man to death. How were those men chosen for the unit? I think they tended to choose themselves. There were those who had a record of serious violence within the prison. Those whose mental makeup, the type of offence they had committed, and the danger they presented to the public suggested that they weren't making any progress through their life sentence and were unlikely to do so. So these are the types of men whom we have brought together in the special unit. Alex Stephen, former controller of Scottish prisons, was on the working party responsible for starting the unit. There were many reasons why something new was needed in the prison system. Old buildings and old attitudes were only part of the problem. Prison staff were becoming extremely concerned at the number of serious assaults on the men who had to patrol the crowded cell blocks. One measure used to try and stamp out the violence was a segregation unit at Porterfield Prison, Inverness. Troublemakers were sent there for a sharp disciplinary lesson. But since a riot which ended with four prisoners being charged with the attempted murder of six officers, the Porterfield unit has never been used. A new approach was obviously needed. So they removed five prisoners who were then seen as the most dangerous and troublesome men in the system and put them together in the special unit. There was also the point that the abolition of capital punishment presented us with a new problem. The Scottish Prison Service had never had to contain someone literally for the rest of his life. But with the abolition of capital punishment, I had to look forward to being able to do that. Quite naturally, the Scottish Prisoners or Prison Officers Association were concerned. They felt, particularly where a lifer was concerned, that he could murder again within the prison setting and appear to get no additional sentence. So in conjunction with the Prison Officers Association, we set up a working party to study how best we could deal with the violent prisoner and also how we could determine how best to treat the man who was going to be in prison for the rest of his life. And of course, sometimes these two categories overlapped or coincided. I mean, we were in and people kept telling us we were in for life, we'd never get out. So what the hell do you do? That, that, people were using that as an excuse in order for you to treat you just like an animal. You know, so if they're going to treat you like an animal, you have no hope, you have no future. By Christ, I'm going to react like an animal. Because there was no other, you couldn't turn the other cheek, you couldn't just sit down and accept because I have to live with myself. I've had the worst of Peterhead. I've had the worst of Inverness. I've been in solitary confinement for four and a half years. I've been taken to hospital twice after incidents with prison guards. Brutality won't affect me. It won't change my pattern of living. The, the system here will. In what way? Or how will it change it? Well, if people will approach me in a reasonable manner, then I will react in a reasonable manner. But if people approach me in a, a very aggressive and physical sort of way, I'll respond in that way. What, what effect does prison have on someone like yourself? Well, uh, the degrading aspects come immediately. As soon as you're in, you know, you're stripped naked in front of people. You're, you're made to take a bath as if you were filthy. The bath only got about four inches of water in it anyway. And then you're given a uniform that doesn't fit you. And you're, you're, you're made to, to work at stupid things like sewing mailbags. You know? And if you talk, they shout at you in a very aggressive fashion. And there's an accumulation of 
petty things like that that goes on and on and on. And worst of all are the prison officers who seem, seem to get really jumped up like Nazis, you know, because they've got this black uniform on. They strut about, you know, and they really think that there's something great about being a prison officer. Do you not think, though, that prison officers, in fairness to them, might treat you slightly differently than other prisoners because of your past record? That could be true after I had started assaulting them. But they, they treated me this way before I assaulted them. I mean, I was in uh, over a year before I seriously assaulted a prison officer. And uh, by the time I had reached the decision to attack a prison officer, I was nearly going mad. I couldn't do my time. Before that, I had done wee sentences. Nine months was my highest. But when I got life, I thought I would never get out, never see freedom. So I started rearing up, doing a lot of dark things. What sort of things did you do, for instance? My first bit of trouble was in the tailor's shop, Peter Head. I lifted one of the sewing machines and flung it through one of the windows. But it was an armor-plated window. The sewing machine just bounced back and hurt me. For that, I got locked up for 14 days all round, and that was the start of my troubles. Once I was in the cells, I began to like it. Ever since then, I kept on getting into trouble to get put into the cells, get peace and quiet. Well, you're 22 years old, and you're told when you come in, if you behave yourself, you can get out in 10 years. And when you're 22 years old, this is it's hard to visualise 10 years ahead in prison, you know? So I think I really give up hope at the beginning. You know, I was really shattered and I really gave up hope and I wasn't really worried about freedom. You know, I thought I'd been unjustly done, so I wasn't aiming to get out. I didn't really care about getting out when I first got done here. And this, uh, I think, was the reason why I got into so much trouble. And later when I changed, the, the officers didn't accept that I had changed, you know. They thought I was the terrible person I was to begin with. And this, I feel, caused all my trouble, you know. The prison officer traditionally is a figure of authority. He sees in the special unit that the staff there no longer rely on the authoritarian approach. Therefore, he may feel that the example of the special unit could erode his position in the normal prison setting. I think what they're failing to understand is that a unit like the special unit can only be run on the basis of small numbers. You couldn't do it on the basis of, say, a large local prison like Barlini. Some prisoners do feel that the worse you behave, in fact, the worse you are, the better you're treated by being sent into the unit. I don't think this is so, and if the prisoners did feel this, I think would have very many applications to come into the unit. As a matter of fact, we've had only one application to come into the unit since it opened. I think many more of the prisoners see a grave danger in being transferred into the unit because they still have in their minds that it could be a stepping stone to the state mental hospital. Due to my past experiences in prison, you know, I was very apprehensive as to what the unit was all about because anything I'd heard about it would come from prison officials, you know. That was the prison officials that came for the unit in order to interview me. And I felt, uh, I felt it was a stepping stone for Kirsters to certify me insane for Kirsters. You know, that was my original picture of the unit. And when you got here? Well, when, even when I got here, you know, it took a few months in order for me to see. Just that it was genuine, you know. Mm. Because there was five years here at that time, you know, and it was, everyone else had the same suspicions, you know. We thought the place was bugged. We thought there was... Um, they were waiting with big injections, you know, to dope us up every two minutes, but, you know, it never turned out like that. Have you been surprised at how well things have gone here? I mean, there does seem to be some sort of relationship between yourselves and, and the officers here. Yeah, well, no doubt about it. Well, when you consider that um, I'm now very close to some of the stuff in here, whereas the seven years previous to that, I'd hardly spoken to any Warder. Was this really just clutching at a straw at the last hope? More There's no doubt about it, you know, because <clears throat> when you consider that I'd just come from a cage in Inverness. an Inverness prison and I'd been kept there for four and a half years, I had nothing. 
any food was thrown under the cage. There was no talk or dialogue between me and any of the prison people there. And to be thrown into this situation, you know, it offered me something, whereas the cage existence, I became so alien to the outside world, it became so alien to me that it was hard to understand that there was a world outside. Well, I arrived at the station and that I was handed over by two Peterhead prison officers, you know, taking out the handcuffs and handed over. And I got into the van <coughs> and the officer put his hand forward and says, uh, my name is Gus, you know, pleased to meet you. And this really, to me, was really shattering, you know. And I says, this is, you know, I couldn't have taken in, I thought this was a big con, you know, I said, this isn't real, you know. This guys don't feel this way about me, you know. And then when I got up here, Jimmy and Larry and Ben met me, you know. And the free atmosphere, they were in their own clothes, and uh, when I came in through the door, the, when you usually come into a prison, you come into a reception and they strip you down, they search you, look through your body with instruments, and uh, when I came in here, they says, uh, I'm going to get a coffee and talk to the boys, and you can come down and check your gear later, you know. And they were walking about calling officers with their first name, and the officers were calling them with their first name. I was beginning to wonder what kind of place I'd go into, you know. It was a place for human and nuts or something, you know. I was wondering if they were on drugs, to tell you the truth, though. Because to see Larry and, and Jimmy this way, you know, it was a real shock to me. Yeah, well, I heard I was coming here just after, the, let me see, two months after a riot at Inverness, you know. I was lying in the solitary and two officers came up from here and told me I was being selected for a special unit. So I says, aye, aye. <laughs> Same thing as Inverness, you know. Or maybe some sort of funny farm, you know. You know, they were giving us out. So I came down here and I says, there's no bars, there's no cages, there's no straight jackets that I can see, you know. So there must be a catch. So I've been fishing about. And to be honest, I still can't see the catch, you know. When you were at this cementing stage of it, cementing the relationship here, uh, you yourself were going to attack another prison officer, weren't you? Yeah, well, that was really a long time ago. Mm -hmm. That was uh, before I went to trial in Inverness and I had a beard then, you know. So I uh, went in and I took the clippers, you know, I was taking my beard off and this officer came in and he pulled the clippers away. He says, you can't take a beard off without permission. And this was half past six in the morning, you know. And I was never at my best at half past six in the morning. And this was about um, a fortnight after I came here, this was. So I just grabbed him by the throat and pushed him against the wall and then there was actually two inmates that had come down with me from Inverness that separated us, you know. You had scissors in your hands. What were yeah. you going to do? Well, I wasn't going to do any of the scissors. The scissors were only part of the cutting the beard off, you know. I think the officer probably saw me with, with this, because I had the grip him with the throat and I had the scissors in my hand. No doubt the relation of me and a pointed weapon and grabbing him by the throat made him think that, that he was intended to be stabbed. But I never consciously or as far as I know, unconsciously formed any intention of stabbing him, you know. Well, despite what you say about not hurting him, the officer involved in the assault said that if it had taken place in a normal prison setting that he wouldn't be alive today. Well, uh, yeah, I think he may be over-dramatising the situation to say that he'd be dead. I mean, he can't possibly say that, can he? But uh, a normal prison setting, he would have got injured, yes. How? Because Why? it would have escalated, you know. In normal prison things don't just drop there and de-escalate. If you grab a prison officer, he takes out his truncheon, and then you can apologise if you like, you get hit with that truncheon, you know? Yeah, well, I was in another part of the unit, and somebody come running round for me and says, Larry's acting up. So when I went round there, they were all there, and there was a struggle, you know, and I immediately jumped in, you know, and Larry had his scissors in his hand, and I just take, took them from him, you know? But I don't think Larry, Larry was going to use these scissors, you know. I, it just so happened they had them because it was a beard and haircut situation. And um, obviously that made it look worse for the staff point of view, considering Larry and my reputation. But, you know, OK, I, d I did step in, simply because 
at that time I seen just what this place was all about, you know. In fact, I think that was maybe a good thing that, that happened because it really after that it stabilised the place. It let us see because at that point no staff pulled out their buttons and started hitting everybody in sight what they do in every other place. They were trying to um, pacify the situation and we did the same. Everybody acted very responsibly and Larry after it recognised the folly of the thing, you know. To me, the way I reacted to that is because I think this was my last straw. I knew that if this place didn't come, I would be as well dead, I'd be as well. I was finished completely because there was nothing else for me. And if I couldn't accept this, then that was it, you know. And it's a hell of a lot to throw away when you're last. People don't throw their life away like that, you know. We suddenly took no action against them. That was left to the unit to deal with. Our reaction was that the unit was achieving something because I'm quite sure that before he had been in the unit, he wouldn't have stopped at threatening. He would have carried out the threat. But if someone had attacked an officer in the same way in an ordinary prison setting, uh, he would have been punished for it. Yes, he would have been punished more formally. I think uh, Larry was punished a much more uh, personally to him, made feel much more responsible. He, uh, he saw, I think started to see then his responsibility for his part of the unit. Everyone shares a strong interest in making the unit work. But there are additional unseen pressures on the prisoners during their term here compared to normal prison life. Misbehaviour in another jail would bring punishment on your own head. But here, violence could jeopardise the whole unit and lead to its being closed down. If that happened, a prisoner would lose what he sees as the last chance of a reasonable life in the years ahead. So would his mates. This has led to prisoners being more responsible. But this change of attitude is just as profound for the staff, who are all volunteers. Well, of course, I think in terms of direct relationships, this is something that, uh, you know, I suppose you could apply it to your ordinary, everyday relationships you build up anywhere, despite the fact that, you know, we're dealing with people who are in prison. And the theory and the practice that we've worked in here is to respond or develop a relationship with prisoners in exactly the same terms as we would uh, develop relationships with people outside. You know, after the initial apprehensions, there must still have been fears, anxiety, suspicions on either side. I mean, even although you, you once, once you got used to each other, how were those eliminated? You know, eliminated purely by trust in both, both ways. The, the more, if you give responsibility to people, they accept the responsibility. And by giving responsibility, then you build up trust. If they accept that responsibility and live up to it, then the trust comes across the other way. And it's a two-way thing ongoing the whole time throughout the whole concept of the unit since ever it's been started. And trust and responsibility has been increased. The prison service tends to take away all the responsibility from a prisoner, tells him when to get up, when to eat, when to go to work, even when he can have his recreation. What the unit has been doing is be putting the responsibility back to the prisoner, making him responsible for his own programme and for carrying it out. I might get up at six o'clock in the morning, cook the boys a breakfast, I make a lunch, tea, and I go out in the shop for messages. Or if we need anything special, I'll go out. We've only got about two pounds to spend on food, so it's just to supplement your diet, you know, sausage and curries and things like that. You can't buy meats or anything like that. Just some vegetables. I think they quite enjoy it because the main point is uh, you can eat when you're hungry and they get it hot and that's a big improvement, you know. Yeah. I think the philosophy of this place is obvious, you know, because they've tried the other system for so long and it's never worked. I think this is the obvious way if you, and it's the best way of assessing a man. If you've got a situation like this where, where you're, you get to know people, I was up in Peterhead for nine years, and in nine years no officer could possibly say he knows me. I know these guys aren't going to take a chance and make out a good report. Why should they? Because I could, uh, they think I could go out and do something, and if they made out a good report, it falls back on them. But in a situation like this, the officers get to know me, and you can't possibly wear a mask. 
like you can do in other systems. You can't possibly wear a mask for 24 hours a day when you're sitting talking to a guy every day and you're living with him. The men here in the nine months that I've been here know me far, far better than anybody up at Peterhead in the nine years I was up there. Had you found that you'd missed anything in particular? Yes, I'd, uh, you miss feminine company. Not only uh, the sex thing, uh, the softness of women. In, in prison, you've got to wear a mask, a shell, you know, you, you portray yourself as a, a sort of hard man sort of image, and you've got to keep it up, and you can't break down and be soft and, and, and be your natural self like you can when, when you're speaking to, to women and outside people, you know? And it was great to, to throw off the mask and, and be your natural self. Ian, some people might think that you have it fairly easy in the special unit. Well, I can definitely say that these kind of people want to come in and try and do their time in here, because we definitely haven't got it easy. We've got certain advantages in this jail, like some of my budgies. I've got a record player. I get out to see my dad. That gives me hope. But also, the staff, that is how they're gaining us. They're gaining us hope. That way, we kind of get into trouble. After getting these kind of things, we kind of get into trouble. Say, likes are getting sent back to another jail. This could never happen, because we'd lose all the privileges. That's how I'd never get into trouble. Uh, my life again. It's because I'm in the unit after having received the budgies and everything else. That's the only things they've given me. Budgies and seeing my dad. So really from being in a position where you had nothing to lose, you've now got, in prison terms, quite a lot to lose. I've got a very lot to lose, yes. My father, my budgies, as I already said, yes. It has to work, because it all gives us hope, the likes of Jimmy, Larry, and even myself. We never thought we'd see freedom, but now we do know that we'll get out someday. I go once a month to see my father in a dressing, who's 86 years of age. You, you say that you get out officially once a month, but there are other occasions too when you, when you get out, aren't there? Uh, certain occasions. If I want to buy new budgies or go to a budgie show, I get out. How often would that be? It depends on the staff. We have a community meeting and ask them. There is a certain opinion outside, and I'm sure you're aware of it, that people in this unit really shouldn't get out at all, that they might well be a danger to the public. Well, they're definitely wrong there. Definitely. Well, if I was one of those persons, how would you assure me that I was wrong? I'd have to bring you into the unit to see the guys before you'd believe it. Definitely none of us want any trouble. We're all getting on a heavy of work and we want to see freedom. What now are your thoughts about the incident that brought you here, the, the murder? It's worse now. At night, I feel sad and I feel lonely. I feel angry at committing the murder. It's a stupid looking back on it. Now that I've got hope, I don't feel like going back home not to live because I did the murder at home. I don't feel at all going back home because of the person I killed. I miss her. She's the only girl in my life. And I lie and think about it every night. And I think most murderers, it's committed a murder at prison in mind. Although a lot of them will tell you different. Ian, you go up before the parole board in a few months' time now. Yeah. What sort of hope do you have of them approving of your parole and of you eventually being released? I've no hope of getting parole. I go up in April in the parole board, but I've no hope. I've no hope for the next five years. I'll have to do 12 years before I've got hope. I know that. No hope whatsoever of me getting parole for five years. You've been in for 14 years now, Rab. You go up before the parole board in just a few weeks from now. How hopeful are you of parole this time? Well, uh, I've already been knocked back once here, and that was after I was here a year. And I've got, I've got a lot of hope, and they've given me a lot of hope with what they've done, the officers and staff and that, or the inmates. They've helped me a great deal, and uh, as I say, it, it wouldn't make any difference to me. The only difference it will make is if I don't get it. 
What sort of work have you been doing outside? Well, I've been doing a bit of helping to build a stage in the Citizen Theatre there and moving a lot of the scenery and all this, you know. I've been doing a bit of painting, which has been my job all my through my sense. And I've made a lot of toys in that, you know. Yeah. What would you say, Lamb, to the, the people who condemn this type of treatment for uh, people who've been convicted of, of killing and, and people who have shown violent tendencies in prison? Well, these people don't understand what we, what most Aussies went through. And to realise what they're talking about, they would have to be in jail. You know, this is all I can say. They would have to be in prison or so, even for a week, to understand what we go through, you know. Even for what we've done, well, it's 14 years for what I've done, and it's as far as I'm concerned, it's just uh, too much, you know. They're just they're, they're making me a prisoner that's got no hope, no chance in any other system but this one. Mm. Of course, you were convicted of of, of murder, of stabbing uh, another youth. Yeah. Do you ever look back on that with any sorrow now? Well, you. You always look back in sorrow because as, you, as I've grown up, which has taken a long while, but when I did, you realise that it has been very wrong, you know, and you know that you know there's no chance of you doing it again. No. Well, how certain are you there's no chance of you ever doing something well, like that again? Because I'll walk away from any trouble you now, which I have done, you know, in paroles and this. You just walk away from these sort of things because you can't afford to be in this situation because you know you're going to come back and do another 14 years and this is something nobody wants in the prisons. You know? What I've what, what done, the fights that I get in with people and slash people and things like that, they could have, they, I mean, they, they were capable and did do the same thing to me, you know. And it was this sort of jungle existence, this acceptable jungle existence amongst each other, the environment, you know. It was perfectly acceptable, you know, but... Again, I must say that I now see it as being futile, and I now see it as I'm doing something that I never dreamt I'd ever be doing now. You talk about the jungle existence. Many people say that dangerous animals should be locked up forever. Just so long as they're dangerous, you know. But, you know, what do you do? I mean, do you turn around and say, OK, that's that guy, he's, he's done this, keep him away, put him away for life? Well, I mean, if you think about that, put a person away for life, who's going to open them up? Who's going to um, start keeping them there for life? Especially the treatment as it is in prisons, where it's solely degradation and humiliation. I mean, a guy's going to be more of an animal and react more of an animal under that treatment, and that's what happens here. You know, I say that um, in, my, in my own case, I feel like I've got something positive. I think that people should use that. I'd like a chance to maybe speak to kids in Borstal. And not in an evangelistical sense, but you know, just what it's all about, you know, the futility, the life I read. Because what you've got to remember is there's kids in my district and kids in Boston's young offenders look up to me simply because I'm supposed to be this wild man and the reputation, you know. So I would like to sort of help them, you know, try to let them see, you know, the true situation. There's nothing nice about coming in to spend the rest of your life in prison, nothing nice at all. You know, there's nothing glamorous about it, you know. I have to um, live with my experiences. For Christ's sake, I don't want any other kid um, having the experience, especially my own son, and that's how I'd like to try and guide him. That's what this place allows me to do, Get, sort of guide him in some sense, and in, in the hope that this can also affect some of his pals or any other kids that go out to prevent them from coming into the, the criminal life. You know, hopefully this is what I would do, but certainly there's sorrow, you know, and there's... I feel that, you know, why does it... what, what alternative... why should we have these um, situations, you know? And that's why I'm doing this um, Open University thing, simply because I have to work at getting the qualifications in order for... to try and help the situation, because nobody will touch me if you've not got the qualifications, being the sort of person I am. From the tough Gorbals background, where his name was often feared, Jimmy is not only studying for an open university degree, but has made a name for himself in another direction, as a sculptor. I can still remember his laughing at it. 
when Joyce Lane, an art therapist, came in with seven pound a clay, just for the five years in here and put it down, just for fun. And um, from there, you know, we're messing about with it. And from there, I created two pieces. And when she came back a fortnight later, she seen probably a latent talent brought to the surface. And she made some noise and got the materials and for there it's went right on. And to me it's really um, wonderful because here I'm doing something in the creative sense. After all this destruction, here's this creation coming out, you know. What sense of satisfaction does it give you to be able to create rather than destroy? And I, exp I think I express myself um, very strongly in the work that I create, you know. Because during these past seven years in prison, I've never been allowed to express myself. I can't afford to have an off day. I can't afford to um, be upset because prison rules don't allow it. You know, and I feel I'm getting all my emotions, all my feelings out in my sculpture. Even your aggression, perhaps? Even my aggression. Everything's been channeled in, into it. You know, when I get... Some of the best times for me to work is when I'm angry. I'm frustrated and, you know, I just pour the, probably the hate and frustrations into the work that I'm creating. You had a very successful exhibition at Edinburgh Festival. What was your sort of reaction your first time out of prison after seven and a half, eight years? Well, it was really very strong, you know. It was... What you've got to remember, 18 months ago, no future in this cage, and now walking along the street. I mean, people... I mean, I was looking at people's faces. I was looking at... It was, you know, it was amazing. I went into a shop and run all over the shop, looking, just drinking and everything in my eyes. My eyes were so thirsty for normal human actions. What people do, walking along with a shopping bag, women with kids in the pram, to, to see this, you know, was really, it was overwhelming. It was a very emotional thing, you know, and it was wonderful, really f fantastic, because this was, I never thought I'd have this again. I never thought I'd walk a street, to me, to touch a pavement, you know, and to feel like glass window, these were things that mad, and also to buy something over a counter, you know. Okay, people take all that for granted, but for Christ's sake, if only they knew what it meant to me, you know. To me it was tremendous, I went into my exhibition, as I went in, the BBC were there, and, you know, one thing that Prisons Department abhor his publicity for any parolees. So I took fright and ran into a toilet <laughs> and locked myself in and the two prison staff were away and we stood outside so I was locked in a loo for the first hour of freedom <laughs> um, till six times as the BBC left. <laughs> and Jimmy's outing to the Edinburgh Festival was criticised by some newspapers. The same happened when he recently went into hospital and when Ian was allowed to visit his home one weekend. Although the press have been inside the unit, some staff and prisoners are still resentful of what they see as a lack of understanding, sometimes spiced with sensationalism, a topic that was discussed at a unit meeting. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't, uh, people shouldn't know what's happening. The press wasn't, uh, wasn't very good, but then it wasn't very bad. We've had worse press. I've certainly come down in Jimmy Boyle, you know, but there's four other, um, three other inmates in this unit got out. And no, nothing was done about them. Nobody came in heavy against them. You know, I'm just one of many, you know, and it's been um, okay that I'm getting out, but that doesn't mean that I'm getting out um, tomorrow free. I've got a hell of a long time to do. Okay, but I'm still getting contact with the outside world. But OK, press is, press is there. I, I can see the press um, letting the, the public know, but I don't see that it should stop progress in the case. I don't see it should detract or stop Maverick and out, and I hope that's not the case. If I was in a normal prison, I'd be getting out anyway, in the length of time I've been in. I was in a training situation in an ordinary prison. So I don't see the press has got any kick with me. People are failing to understand what we're trying to do here. The fact that I'm going to, that's the only way this unit will be tested, and as to how we react to, to, to the um, press. Certainly, we'd, 
we don't like it, but to a large extent, I must say, we've all been rather philosophical about it and says, well, OK, this is, the, this is the problem we've got. We've got to get it over, and that's why you are in here today. You know, but OK, you're in here as a reporter. What do you see See the situation? You, you're a member of society. What do you see? You're a member of the public. You're in here as a rep representative of the public. What is your um, feelings on it? On the publicity? Yeah. Well, I think as a journalist that uh, they were quite right in reporting it. But I th what, what I find uh, surprising is that the press having been in here, that there's still uh, a certain amount of sensationalism attached to the visit, which is why I ask again the question, you know, has this unit failed to get across to the public what it's doing? No, no I, well, don't I don't accept so. that. I think, I, no, I think you've got to, as a journalist, accept some of the stick of um, bad journalism. You know, I think we have behaved very responsible towards the press. We brought them in, we showed them. Now, all we were asking for was objective um, reporting. We didn't want reporting which would build us up or re reporting that would smash us down. We wanted straight objective reporting that would get the facts across to the public of what we were doing in here. Uh, I think we got that in our first press coverage. Um, but on this particular article about Jimmy, um, I think there was the old sensationalism that was coming in. Oh, this is a great story, you know, let's spread it, you know. Um, a great outrage was caused by James Boyle going, etc., etc., etc. What outrage? By whom? You know, it, it failed to stay who was outraged. Um, I think the press has got to grow up a lot on when it comes to prisons. Um, prisons are great, bad, bad news stories. They always have been. But the press has really got to sort of grow up in this respect and sort of take objective views of what's going on inside prisons today. Uh, but what the public, I think, has got to realise and what journalism has got to realise, that we in here are responsible people. People dislike what happens in here, fair enough. Um, people like what happens in here, fair enough. And the broad consensus of um, prison staff, I think, are somewhere between the two extremes. You know, they want to be able to make a balanced judgment. We're still very much an experiment. We will be an experiment for a long time to come. He went out and uh, went through there to Edinburgh with two members of staff, saw the exhibition, his own one and others, and came back. Well, this is what it's all about. This is what gets me, you know. It's all this sensational stuff, but nobody ever takes the positive side of it. The fact is, I did act responsibly through there. You know, nobody's willing to give people that sort of credit. All they want to do is put people down. Put, we can all go on putting people down, but that's not what it's all about. No one here. Any decision that came to take me out was made maturely and very responsibly. And that, that is proved by the fact that I'm sitting here, by the community in here. We don't just say, OK, let's take Jim out and that's it. In here, we really um, discuss it. And at the end of the day, after m much conversation, much, we had to fight a hell of a lot to get it. But at the same time, it did come, and the department come ways. The result is well, we've, we've proven ourselves correct, and any decision we've made is correct. You know, all we ask for people to do is to try and understand what we're trying to do. We're doing something here. It's a hell of a lot more positive than any, anything else that I've ever seen in the penal system. And all we're saying is try and bear ways and see what we're doing. Is the best thing that's ever happened to the Scottish prisons, not just here, you know? Because Jimmy is supposed to be one of the most violent prisoners. Now he can be taken out, escorted to an Edinburgh festival. Now I think that must give the fellas up in Peterhead and other prisons a bit of hope. This unit's um, given me some hope. By saying that, I don't mean that I'm going to be out in five years' time or out in ten years' time. I mean that there's hope at the end of the tunnel now, you know, whereas before, um, what you. Is it, I can, so you have to go back, keep going back to the, the situation that the intensity of the last six years was tremendous and it was hard for me to, um, when I look back and I, want, I say to myself, how the hell did it, I go insane then? But fortunately I've come out of it, you know, and this place has offered an alternative, you know, something even my own district didn't offer. This has offered me an alternative, it's shown me a different of life and it's, it's really made, it's really created new energy within me, new drive, only in a positive way rather than a negative sense. You have to be very, very realistic here and uh, 
view each sentence as it comes up. Now, if the life sentence does the average of somewhere between 10 and 15 years, and then I, I do the rest, it means I do something like 20 odd years inside, right? Which makes me come out like maybe when I'm 46 or something. But there's so many ifs and, and buts in this case that uh, I really don't see any possibility of getting out. You know? Well, what sort of life will you make for yourself in here? Well, I'll just do what I'm doing now. Uh, I'll read a lot. I'm trying my hand at uh, writing a couple of things, you know, short stories and a novel, you know. I just... I try not to get institutionalised, you know. Do you feel that society has any right, really, to lock someone away for the rest of his life until he dies? Well... That depends entirely on both the society and the individual. In your case? In my case, I'm completely biased, you know. So I couldn't give you a very objective answer. I could say, yes, society could let me out and I wouldn't do any harm. And I wouldn't do it any harm. But has society got the right to keep me in? I don't know. Do you hold out any hope whatsoever of ever being released before you die? None. It's no part of the prison service to destroy a man. And if we're going to keep a man inside for a very, very long time, I think we must take certain steps to preserve his dignity, to preserve his interest, to prevent him turning into a cabbage. And I think it's essential that he has some contact with the outside world. And if this is, this is properly ordered, one would see it continuing. Alec, could I just take you one at a time through them? JC, for instance, what is the situation with him now? Well, he's made remarkable progress since he's come into the unit, and he's currently being considered um, by the parole system. This, of course, in itself is no indication that release is anywhere near. But at least, you know, there is hope. One cannot put it higher than that. How about Rab? Here again, uh, he has made some progress, more over the last few months than he had done, say, in his first year in the unit. Again, this is another case in which one can see hope. And Ian? This is an extremely difficult case to answer. Certainly he has, so far as he is able, participated in the working of the unit. He has become very slowly and very gradually a part of the community. But there are very many difficulties where he is concerned. Jimmy? Complex one. His history doesn't help him in any way. One can only say that one cannot see release for him for a very long time, indeed, without trying to put any term on it. How about Larry? I suppose, as he says himself, the most hopeless case of all.